Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I'm Kathy Hawks, Associate Dean for External Relations and Global Programs. It is so nice to see students from all over campus, so thanks for being with us today. This event today is in partnership with the Office of Foundation Relations, so thank you so much for your partnership. And as many of you know, iLead is our premier speaker series that brings principled, innovative leaders who improve the world to campus, and today is a shining example of that. So two things you need to know before I get on to introductions. First is that we will be using Poll Everywhere today, so there'll be a QR code on the screen. Please scan that or text your questions as the session goes along and Nelson will manage that at the end of our program via iPad here. The second is that we're recording our session today, so you'll get a recording out to your email in a couple of weeks. So before things, I turn over to Nelson a few words of introduction. Our moderator today is Professor Nelson Repenning. Nelson is the Associate Dean for Leadership and Special Projects at MIT. He is the School of Management Distinguished Professor of System Dynamics and Organizational Studies. He is also the director of the faculty director of the MIT Leadership Center. Our distinguished speaker today is Dr. Rajiv Shah. Dr. Shah is the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, a global institution committed to promoting well being for humanity around the world through data, science, and innovation. Under his leadership, the foundation raised and deployed over a billion dollars to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and have launched a $10 billion global energy alliance for people and the planet. He is the author of Big Bets, How Large-Scale Change Really Happens, and we have a copy for you after all, for all of you today. Dr. Shaw is a graduate of the University of Michigan, the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, and the Wharton School. He has received many honorary degrees, including the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award and the U.S. Global Leadership Award. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shaw to MIT. Over to you, Nelson. Thank you. So, Raj, welcome. It is really a pleasure to have you here today, and thank you so much for taking the time. Um, all right. You know, a little echo there, sorry about that. Um, at any rate, why don't we start with a little context. Uh, one of the things that I often joke with my students here is that if you ask an eight or 10 year old what they wanna be when they grow up, they rarely say executive vice president with dotted lines to the functions in the organization. Uh, I imagine that leading a foundation was not something that you probably aspired to at that age. So tell us a little bit about your career path. How did you kind of end up here? Uh, at Rockefeller. Sure. First, can I just say thank you for that very kind and generous introduction, and thank you for uh, hosting me here, and thank you to the MIT community. I'm a huge fan of this institution and what you do, and I've had, and I'm sure we'll get into it, I've had the chance to serve President Obama and lead uh, USAID, and I recall uh, doing really extraordinarily fun, creative, and innovative, and ultimately highly impactful things with uh, many of the faculty and students and structures that have been set up here. And it always occurred to me this is a campus packed with people who have obviously extraordinary talent and skill and technical knowledge, uh, but also this unique passion of applying it to make a real difference. And so it's really special for me to get to be with you, and, and thanks for, for having me. Uh, eight, as an eight-year-old, uh, what did I want to be when I grew up? I knew actually with certainty what I wanted to do as an eight-year-old. <laughs> Um, and that is, I wanted to uh, I wanted to run a car company. I wanted to have my own car company. Uh, I grew up in suburban Detroit, uh, where you drove by car companies all the time. My dad worked at Ford Motor Company for thirty years, and my uh, both favorite hobby, but also you know, if you went to public school in suburban Detroit, uh, taking automotive design and pre-engineering drafting and things like that were things you just did. And it was part of the normal curriculum starting in about seventh grade. And so I wanted to design cars. And I won my Pinewood Derby as a kid by taking my Pinewood Derby car into this little wind tunnel at Ford and optimizing its performance and crushing the competition. And that was kind of the How future. How did you not end up at MIT? I know. That was kind of the future. And uh, it didn't occur to me there would be anything else worth doing uh, until quite a ways into the future. OK. Um, fabulous. So tell us a little bit about Rockefeller. Uh, we pride ourselves here on being the Sloan School of Management, not the Sloan School of Business. 
Nonetheless, I think we tend to focus on for-profit organizations, and I'm not sure that big foundations and other NGOs sort of get as much press around here. So tell us a little bit about the work that you do and kind of how you use that institution to make an impact on the world. Yeah. So the Rockefeller Foundation, which I'm honored to lead, has been around for more than 110 years. It was founded, as you know, by John D. Rockefeller uh, with this massive fortune from Standard Oil. And the vision was actually very simple and very MIT in its ethos. It was the basic idea that we could use science and innovation to lift up people who were vulnerable. And when uh, John D. Rockefeller and his advisor, Frederick Gates, kind of debated what that proposition would mean in 1903 and 1904, and they shared all these letters back and forth, they had a couple of ideas that basically stood the test of time. One was uh, that this emerging field of medicine and health should actually be a science-based discipline and focused on lifting up the public, not just serving the very wealthy. And that led to decades of building uh, modern medical and public health systems, inventing vaccines like the yellow fever vaccine, eradicating hookworm in the American South, uh, incubating the precursor to the World Health Organization, and more recently, uh, I think, work that we did that I document in the book to fight COVID by expanding testing um, at scale in the United States and, and around the world with our partners. The second big thing they debated would be an interesting application of science to lift people up was around agriculture. And they looked around and saw a world where 50% of the population, or if not more, lived in subsistence situations and felt and were engaged in agriculture and felt science applied to agriculture could be the grand uh, scalable solution that would lift people up. And that uh, pursuit over decades led to the Green Revolution an effort that moved 800 million people off the brink of starvation in the 60s and the 70s, uh, earned my predecessors at the foundation a Nobel Peace Prize, uh, which we commemorate on the wall. If you ever come visit us, <laughs> you'll, you'll see a, a little presentation uh, in recognition of that uh, and, and serves as an inspiration. So today, when we ask ourselves, well, where can that mission be applied, science and innovation to transform uh, vulnerability and the human condition at scale, it leads us to a few conclusions. The first is we should be very focused on climate. The climate is the existential threat that um, threatens to double the number of people that are hungry, that threatens to displace two billion people that live in coastal communities, that will wipe out fisheries and livelihoods for, for more than a billion people that depend on that for their source of protein primarily. And I could go on and on and on. And frankly, compared to other eras when global leadership came together to construct an architecture for peace in the Western world, for example, after World War II, right now the global fight on climate is deeply underpowered against what's necessary. And we'll talk about it, so I won't get into it in more detail, but we've made a commitment to uh, divest of fossil fuels in our endowment, to target net zero in the management of our resources, to be a net zero organization in our operations, and we've committed a billion dollars going forward to building public-private partnerships in areas like health and energy and food that are gonna be deeply affected by climate change over time. Uh, the other part of that that is our big bet is in fact global energy access. And I'm sure we'll get into it, so I won't describe it here, but the single biggest thing we do is, is called the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet because we think really for the first time in human history, the technology frontier exists to practically and primarily on commercial terms, serve nearly everyone on this planet with low cost, reliable, always on electricity. And if we can do that, we have a real shot at connecting the billion plus people who live in some form of energy poverty to a global modern economy. Uh, so those are some of the big things we're doing right now and, and really our focus, but it's grounded in this MIT-based idea that science and innovation applied broadly for everyone can transform humanity for the better. Fabulous. So we'll definitely come back to climate in a few minutes, but uh, kind of a follow-on question in the book, which we'll get to in its full glory in a moment. You describe really nicely kind of cutting your teeth at Gates Foundation, which at the period you were there, a little bit hard to think of it this way, given the funding was a sort of startup in the foundation world. How do you think about the space of the foundations that are out there and how did it 
feel different going from Gates Foundation to Rockefeller, which is you know one of the most venerable in the in the space. And how are those organizations going to work together to you know tackle some of these major challenges? Well, I'll tell you the first. So I, I you asked me about how I kind of got into this career, and I gave you an answer about my Pinewood Derby experience. The, the, tr the truth is, as you can probably tell, I grew up in a primarily Indian American family. My parents are Indian immigrants, and so if you were pretty good at uh, test taking in school, the two options that I thought were career paths were engineering and medicine. And I chose medicine, uh, some, honestly somewhat reluctantly, but I chose it and, and was committed to it. And along the way, I had this passion to do public service and, and uh, work on a larger scale uh, around global issues. And so uh, over time, I mustered the courage to leave my medical school training and join Al Gore's presidential campaign in Nashville, Tennessee, as an effort to learn about things outside of medicine and engineering. And, uh, and for those of you that remember, and now I'm on college campuses and I find myself explaining what I think you all, you all certainly know. Uh, that was a very close campaign that we thought we won, but it turns out we didn't. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Uh, but, uh, but I found myself unemployed looking for work. And a friend from the campaign connected me to the Gates Foundation right when Bill and Melinda were starting their large scale philanthropic efforts. And the first time I actually met Bill, I said something on the order of, well, I'm, I'll do this for six months or so, but I'm not all that interested in philanthropy. Uh, in fact, I have to go back and practice medicine. And uh, he sort of looked at me and probably didn't hear what I said, uh, because otherwise I imagine I would have been let go of pretty quickly. Uh, and I ended up staying for eight years and just loved it. And I, I dedicate two chapters in the book to what I learned there. Uh, which really was this way of thinking about actually solving and not just making incremental improvements to some of the big challenges we face. And the, the challenge we worked on with a lot of intensity then was the one about immunizing every child from simple diseases that could, uh, could cause childhood mortality and morbidity. And that methodology, which I call big bets and which I've tried to apply and learn from in many other experiences, both in public service and at the Rockefeller Foundation, um, I think came from that original experience to, to tackle the challenge of early childhood mortality because so many kids went unvaccinated. Fabulous. Well, perfect segue to the book. Um, so big bets. Um, Highly recommend it. Uh, I really enjoyed getting ready for this. Um, I mean, you kind of started down this path, but give us sort of a sense of the main message of the book. And also, I could speak from personal experience, writing books are a lot of work. So uh, what possessed you to you know, go with this venue to get those ideas across? Well, I, I wrote the book because I feel like uh, if you just kind of pay attention to the news and to social media and the general zeitgeist, uh, especially if you look at data around what young people think about institutions. There, it just feels like we're losing trust in institutions. Our government looks incapable of you know, tying its shoes on a regular basis. Our global leaders don't necessarily come together in a way that inspires a lot of confidence around tackling the big challenges we face. And, and that can be pessimistic. You know, you, it can be easy to fall into what I call the aspiration trap which is the idea that, OK, these problems exist. They're going to exist. The best we can do is sort of incremental tinkering around the margins. Um, and we, we should accept that. And I think too many of us do accept that. And on the other hand, I feel like I had these unique experiences and had a chance to be exposed to and learn from people who took big bets and made them happen. And whether it was President Obama for the first time in American history deploying US troops to fight a disease and, and, and winning uh, in terms of reducing the prevalence and incidence of Ebola in West Africa before it caused much pandemic threats outside of that geography, or whether it was the Gates effort that you know, started, and I, I tell these stories about the, the rocky early start of that effort, but 20 years in, 980 million kids have been immunized and 16 million child lives have been saved in what I think is one of the great gifts that philanthropy has ever offered to humanity. Um, or our current effort to link a billion people who live in 
abject poverty because they don't have access to electricity and energy, uh, to use the renewable energy technology frontier to target that community and use innovation and collaboration and partnership to lift, lift them up. So I felt it was important to share the methodology that I feel like I've had a chance to learn from others uh, and the big bet mindset to help people be more optimistic about using their skills and their talents and their leadership uh, to make a difference in this world and make a difference at scale. Yeah, so one of the really nice things you do in the opening of the book is sort of outline this popular conception that um, big social change is really only the province of either saints or billionaires and that the rest of us, this is not an area that we can um, sort of play in. So give us a little sense of kind of the basic basics of the big bet methodology. And obviously you all should read the book because it's fabulous. But um, you know, what are some of the high points that anyone can take away in terms of maximizing their impact on the world? Well, you know, big bets start with uh, being passionate about a problem. You want to be where you want to be a big part of the solution. And doing a lot of learning and thinking about what it would take to actually solve and not just tinker on the margins with, that, with the solution to that problem. And when you start to think about how you solve problems, I find there are three core elements of that methodology that can be very helpful. The first is it requires a lot of homework. It requires studying you know, which solutions can actually be scaled in a viable manner to reach enough people to make a huge difference. Immunization is a great example. We did a lot of work on which vaccines and what's the cost structure and what does it cost to vaccinate a single child? What would it then cost to vaccinate the 105 million kids who are born every year, the global birth cohort in 2002? And how many of those kids were getting vaccinated? Who wasn't? What's the gap? What are the ideas that can fill the gap? Because even Bill Gates and Melinda Gates didn't have the resources to fill that gap. And so it, it's a way of thinking that relies on genuine, fresh, innovative solutions like vaccines and new vaccines. Uh, the second element is around building alliances. Because I have found that in order to do these things effectively, you absolutely need public, private collaborators working together. And you know, a lot of times, there's just not a lot of trust between the public policy and public sector leadership and private sector leadership. So finding and learning how to build alliances across that are really important. In the vaccine case, we had to actually restructure financing to restructure the global supply base so there was enough product available to serve that much larger global birth cohort. And there's a whole chapter dedicated to how we did that. But the point is that was a major public-private collaboration that enabled success. And the third and final component is really measuring results. And you know, I think you, this is a community at this institution, at this school, that would very much appreciate this. But you can't really be successful if you don't know what result you're trying to achieve and you don't have a way to measure that result. And so one of the themes throughout the book, whether it's leading the Haiti earthquake reform or uh, response or, uh, or beating back Ebola in West Africa, putting systems in place that allow you to collect data quickly, efficiently, know if you're performing well, even imperfect data that comes in fast uh, can help you define whether you're on the right path. And having the rigor, around, uh, what I call a business-like rigor around measuring results I think is the secret sauce to being successful even in public sector and social sector and philanthropic initiatives that might feel like they're uh, different than you know, running a business, so to speak. That's fabulous. So one follow-on question, one of the things that struck me in reading the book is you touch on what I think is a sort of core question about social change of all sizes, right? Whether it's global or in your organization, which is essentially the difference between a kind of big bet strategy, perhaps naively construed, versus sort of incremental iteration and problem solving. And in the vaccine case, for example, you know, you do really an amazing job of describing all the little things that have to be done right for this to work, 
you know, refrigeration and vaccine production. And then it ends up being a story about financing as much as anything else, which is, it was an impressive plot twist, at least for my. <laughs> so how do you think about that tension between a big bet versus, you know, the ancient wisdom of, you know, a thousand mile journey starts with a um, single step, or we have to solve lots of problems or we're not gonna get it all at once. And is that something that is different for different kinds of problems? Or is there a way that you think about melding those two perspectives? I think those two perspectives go together hand in hand. And my favorite example of that is the Ebola crisis. You know, for those of you that recall, in the summer of 2014, in West Africa, the hemorrhagic fever that is the Ebola virus uh, sort of mu likely mutated and shifted from a rural incident problem to a large, rapidly spreading urban problem. And at that time, the mortality rate for people who caught Ebola was 70% which means basically everybody who caught it was, was perishing. And uh, most of the Liberian healthcare workforce had been decimated and, and too many died. And humanitarian actors were unable to go into the theater of response for personal safety issues. Only one organization, Medicine Sans Frontier, MSF, had the protocol in place to do that and even they couldn't scale their protocol. So, so you know, we were sort of looking, and the CDC then projected that there would be 1.6 million Ebola cases, including a few hundred thousand in the United States. And that, I think, uh, as that reality started to set in, you just saw a lot of panicked uh, behavior and a lot of political behavior in the United States. So in that context, President Obama deployed American troops to build field hospitals, to build what we thought would work, something called Ebola treatment units. And those treatment units were supposed to be places people who were positive could go, get treated, be isolated, and everything would be uh, fine, contagion would go down. But in a 70% mortality environment, people who went to Ebola treatment units never came out. Their possessions, belongings never came out. Their ashes never came out. So very quickly, nobody would go in. And, uh, and we didn't actually know how to solve the problem. The solution came from local communities that were already observing that most of the transmission was in the Liberian custom of washing and treating with respect and redressing the bodies of the deceased. And uh, that's when a lot of contagion was happening. So they started inventing solutions, you know, uh, getting WHO body bags and putting bodies in body bags, putting teams in fully clad protective equipment that would go in, perform a, a ceremony, but remove the body safely before other family members washed and redressed the bodies. Um, and remember, dying of a hemorrhagic fever is pretty, uh, is, is pretty physically challenging and, and uh, messy and, uh, and really quite grotesque in some cases. And so, so uh, those local solutions, ultimately we refined them. We, call it, we designed this burial team solution. We built, uh, you know, hundreds of these teams to go to work in Liberia and Sierra Leone and Guinea, and they quickly reduced transmission by more than 70%. And instead of 1.6 million cases, there were 30,000 cases. And in, instead of hundred, a few hundred thousand in the United States, there were two, and neither one was actually spread in the United States of America. And so, and no American service personnel caught Ebola despite the, the many months long deployment. So, you know, it, President Obama and our team had to say, okay, what's our goal? Our goal was a big bet. It was putting resources into a situation at scale and trying to ensure Ebola went away as a problem in West Africa and didn't spread. But the solutions required really practical, really on the ground, very incremental. Does this work? How do we know this works? Can we make it a little better? Who invented it? What's the, what do people on the ground that are living this experience say? Because we can't solve this from you know, Boston or New York or Washington, DC. Fabulous and super impressive. Um, so let's shift gears just a little bit and talk about leadership. Uh, one of the things that comes out from the book is you, know, you have had contact with quite an impressive collection of successive, successful leaders, ranging from the President of the United States you know, Bill Gates down to community organizers and community leaders that have done, you know, the kinds of things that you just described. I'm curious to hear, number one, what you take away from those experiences. Are there any common elements, particularly given that breadth of people? 
And probably more importantly, and most relevant to this audience, is how have you combined all those lessons into your own particular approach to leading a large and really, you know, now several large and really important organizations? Well, you know, I, I, one of the wonderful things about writing the book is you get to reflect on people you have learned from and partnered with, and frankly, I, that I am personally inspired by. And some are household names, Barack Obama, Bill Gates, Hillary Clinton, but many you have not heard of that had made such an important impression on my own life. One is Dr. Sudarshan, a doctor who went into a rural rainforest in southern India and eradicated leprosy from a small, actually a fairly large community of, of tribal uh, communities that were living in that rainforest. Another is a woman named Molly Melching who went village by village in West Africa talking to tribal leaders to get those tribal leaders to invest in girls and girls' education and girls' opportunity and to prevent early childhood marriage and to outlaw female genital mutilation. And uh, I'd say whether it's Dr. Sudarshan or Molly or President Obama or Bill or anybody else, the, the common, um, common thing I've observed across a lot of those types of leaders is just their absolute passion and persistent commitment to whatever goal they're working on. You know, the, the chapter I write about the Gates experience is called Ask a Simple Question. It's called that because Bill would get us all in a conference room and say, what does it cost to vaccinate a child? What does it cost to vaccinate every child on this planet? And every expert we would bring into that room would say, oh, it's too complicated. That's a very simplistic question. You can't ask it that way. You know, there are all these things you have to think about, and, and it's human resources and refrigeration and the cost of electricity and this and that. But Bill's persistence for years in asking that question was essential to basically unlock an understanding of what are the gaps to actually succeed at scale. Uh, you know, I, I, President Obama, when he launched his big bet to make sure we did everything we could during the Haiti earthquake response to save lives and project American power in a way that showed its moral purpose. Uh, he had such a clarity of, of purpose. And, and I'd say in that setting, that Haiti earthquake response happened alongside um, an American uh, troop acceleration in Afghanistan that I suspect uh, the president was less enthusiastic about having to do. And he wanted to show the world that American force and American power could and would be deployed for good and for a moral purpose. And so when the Haiti earthquake happened, in addition to the core humanitarian priority, he understood how it fit a larger worldview that he had about what our country should represent on this planet and deployed resources in a way that lived up to that. So, you know, there, it's just people have their passions about whatever their passions are. And, and great leaders stay so committed to that passion and that focus and an insistence on being successful. It, you know, when Bill couldn't get his answers from senior experts, he relied on interns like me to do spreadsheet work to get an answer. When the president couldn't get uh, the military to come up with a, a different path in Afghanistan, he used a different approach to demonstrate what this country can do around the world to show that we can use our power for good. And I could go on and on about other leaders um, that I write about in the book, but Molly Melching going, I mean, literally village to village, sitting with tribal leaders and talking to them about girls because that was her passion. So how do you kind of meld that all together in your own approach as you lead Rockefeller, the culture you create, the priorities you set, you know, how do you organize your day in terms of this vast organization and that you, uh, you're in charge of? Well, that, that's a good question. I don't know that I have a very clear answer. I would just say, you know, I'm none of the people that I just mentioned. You know, I, I haven't had the, I'm not a saint. I write about that in the book. I, I couldn't go village to village in West Africa or dedicate my life to living in a rainforest. I tried when I was younger and I thought, this is who I'm gonna be and the mosquito bites and the heat and the food and the, it just wasn't for me. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I realized working with Bill that I wasn't likely to be a centibillionaire and, uh, and, and you know, a genius in that super um, context. But 
in, but what I, my advice to folks here would be just be really authentic to the kind of leader you are. You know, I, I am passionate about serving vulnerable populations. I have been since uh, certain experiences as a kid. And I'm insanely optimistic about the ability to bring people together towards that mission. Uh, and I feel like I've been parts of things that have been highly successful. I've also been parts of things where that passion and, and sometimes naive optimism led to a big failure. And I write about that in the book. I tried to build a massive uh, hydropower dam in the Democratic Republic of Congo to provide four cents a kilowatt hour renewable energy to 250 million people and failed miserably and read about it on the front page of the Financial Times. And you know, it's not, uh, it's not always going to work. Uh, but I would just say think hard about what, about what you really are, about who you are, what you're really good at, and accept it and roll with it. And where you're challenged uh, or where you're less strong, uh, work really hard to put people around yourself or join teams uh, where, as a team, you, you round yourself out. That's fabulous. And I must say, as an editorial comment on you not being a saint, I detected at least two miracles in the book. So <laughs> it seems like you're on your way. All right, we'll talk later. Uh, <laughs> but let's move on to the third miracle that we're all invested in, uh, which you alluded to earlier, which is climate is obviously on everyone's mind. You know arguably the largest existential threat. And it's something that our new president, Sally Kornbluth, has made a priority for here at MIT. You mentioned a little bit about what Rockefeller is doing. I'm curious both, what do you think sort of the more broader sort of ecosystem needs to do to tackle this? I presume it will require multiple big bets. And do you have any advice for us at the Institute in terms of how you know, we should think about maximizing the benefit of what we might have to offer on that yeah. formidable challenge? Yeah, I do. I, look, I think there's uh, the climate challenge is such an extraordinary challenge. If you if you think about it, we are blowing past all this ecosystem tipping points much faster and at a much lower level of aggregate temperature rise than scientists expected uh, for years. And the, perhaps the most easy to understand example of that is is the uh, is the ice melt off the Arctic and Antarctic that is irreversible. You know, and we'll have irreversible consequences. And, and there are eight or nine other major ecosystem tipping points we're hitting at far lower levels of aggregate temperature rise. So you know, there's, a, there's a risk that we think, oh, two to three degrees of temperature rise, which is the path we're on is probably 2.6 to 3, somewhere in that range. And the UN is likely to make that a big part of the next few days in, in Dubai at the COP uh, negotiations. But that that is somehow livable. And it's really not. It's, it's really catastrophic. And it's particularly catastrophic for, for two or three billion of the world's most vulnerable people. So the question then is, well, what can you do about it? This is an area that is absolutely well suited to big bets. Um, it's an area where you can do the math and say, here's the breakdown of, of energy production is a huge contributor. Food production and protein production in particular is another massive contributor of emissions. Changing the way we farm and produce food could be a massive sink in terms of uh, bringing greenhouse gases into the soil and keeping it there. And you could go across the list and find areas where we can transform our economy in a way that creates real opportunity for business, for inventors, for scientists, and for policymakers to deliver jobs and benefits to their communities and their populations. So you know, big, our big bet is in energy and renewable energy. The chapter in the book on that I called uh, Learn How to Let Go or Give Up Control. Because I think, and this is where I think your institute and the leadership uh, courses and training you offer could be helpful. I think certainly as a younger person, I always had an instinct that you want to kind of control the environment you're in. Uh, but, but to work effectively on climate, I think we're going to need these big public-private alliances coming together that are less about controlling uh, exactly what you can do, or if you're in a business, what your P&L is, and more about influence, it, doing that, but also influencing others and uh, sharing insights around what works and what doesn't work and motivating others to have higher aspirations to be part of the solution and not the problem on climate. And in our case, it was, it was even more granular as we, we built a team that worked on 
innovating and inventing some new solutions to energy access, partnered with companies like Tata Power in India and, and smaller uh, companies around the world. We partnered with uh, the MIT and Ernie Moniz and, and uh, Rob Stoner on, on efforts to do analytics around all of that under the rubric of ending, ending energy poverty. Uh, but to really scale that effort, we had to attract capital from others. So we, we got matching commitments from the Bezos Earth Fund and the IKEA Foundation. We motivated another 10 or so billion dollars from other types of institutions, including development finance institutions. And now we have this big alliance that we've incubated inside our institution, but we are in the process of spinning out. And uh, because this is really not something one institution can do. And it's hard to let go. It's hard to give up control. Uh, and it's hard to kind of be less in charge uh, and to really think of your role as enabling others. But on climate in particular, I think we need these big alliances on energy, on food, on protein, on uh, fashion. I mean, there's a whole list of things where we can only really achieve the transformation we want if we have public sector, private sector, and philanthropy slash sources of capital working together in new, new types of business models. That's great. So we're going to switch uh, after one more question to audience questions. So get your poll everywhere going if you haven't done so already. But let me just ask you one more. Um, I imagine I'm not the only one that's sitting here sort of wondering that makes perfect sense in terms of the scale of what's required. But what advice would you give us in terms of what we should do, right? I drive a hybrid vehicle with lots of bumper stickers, but beyond that, you know, I don't know if that's really moving You're the needle. You're a Bostonian, yes, so you exactly have right. to. Well, Cambridge, actually. <laughs> Cambridge, uh, <sorry. laughs> uh, But, you know, you have people here that are going to investment banking and to consulting that are doing startups. They're going to be VCs. You know, how should they think about being part of the solution rather than part of the problem, even if they're not necessarily negotiating one of these big public-private partnerships? Yeah, I'd say the very first thing is, and this is maybe something I've learned just by doing the book and talking to different types of communities across the country, is big bets start with betting on yourself. Like, give yourself a chance to chase your passion. If your passion is making a difference on climate change, or your passion is making a difference on poverty or development or mental health, you'll find a way to do that from wherever your first job is but only if you really, really give yourself a chance to do it. And uh, I don't know what your first jobs are or are going to be. My, you know, I was in medical school, and, and my, in retrospect, I didn't know it at the time, frankly, but in retrospect, like I had one professor and my girlfriend, now wife, who together gave me the confidence to, to leave medical school to join a political campaign. And that ultimately changed my trajectory and gave me the opportunity to explore the things I was most passionate about. You may or may not, that might not be your story, but even if you're at a consulting firm or an investment bank or a graduate school science program, you know, if your passion is climate, you can figure out ways from that position to stay connected to, uh, to learn about and to contribute to the solution. And, but it's gonna be on you to do it and it's going to be on you to kind of bet on yourself. Uh, but ultimately, I'm very optimistic, especially because young people, like many of you here, are, are just so naturally committed. I mean, you're more globally aware than prior generations. You have a deeper understanding of the threats and the risks than prior generations. And, and certainly at MIT, you, you know you are leaders. You are going to be leaders. You're going to be seen as leaders. So we need you in this fight. So I'm not getting the poll everywhere. Questions, Haley, do you have them? Well, why don't we do it the old-fashioned way? Um, let's open it up Open it up for questions. So you have uh, questions for Dr. Shah? Yeah. Yeah, right here. Go ahead. During the pandemic, um, you know, where, where I felt my government was not doing enough uh, to help. Uh, we could see the Rockefeller Foundation in the newspapers donating and helping us uh, with, with the, with, with the, within COVID. Um, I wanted to ask about systems change. Um, you know, you've had extensive experience uh, in going and helping countries where sometimes 
the public sector itself is not incentivized to change their behavior. What was the most successful approaches you saw uh, in driving behavioral change within the public sector? And what sort of change agents have you felt have been the most successful? I mean, it's a broad question, but I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Thank you. Sure. Well, uh, first, thank you for your comment about Kenya. We've, you know, we've had such a productive collaboration in Kenya, but uh, Kenya is a good example of what's happening in many emerging economies right now, uh, where the currency has been devalued, the 62 cents on the dollar is going to external debt repayment, programs in health and education and climate transition are all getting cut at a time when we should be investing more. And that is replicated in nation after nation. And for the first time really since, uh, well, for the first time post-World War II, this, this window of time coming out of COVID, we're seeing real divergence in human development outcomes across where wealthy economies are, are growing faster and experiencing better outcomes, and less wealthy economies are, are going backwards instead of forwards on the sustainable development goals at scale. And uh, we could talk about that endlessly, but it's, it's just a reality of the context, uh, context we're in. Your question about behavior change is an interesting one. I, I have found two things that I write about in the book. One, I write about the Haiti earthquake response uh, because it was a moment when, in an instant, 200,000 people uh, were at threat of losing their lives and ultimately lost their lives. And uh, when the nation, its, its ministries and the United Nations and the security force had physically, the buildings had collapsed and the casualties amongst leadership were so high that the United States had to step in and play a much more active role to drive an effective response. But what I found in that moment, that first night, the president called me, my first call from a president. <laughs> you know, uh, I was about a week into my job, and uh, I got a call from the president. He said, I'm putting you in charge of this response. And that night, I started getting calls from people across USAID and, frankly, across the federal government. And they said, hey, you know, you don't know me yet. Uh, but I've responded to earthquakes before, and I'm really good at this, and I'm in Peru right now, but I'll be on a flight back to D.C., and I'm going to help make this work. Or you don't know me yet, but I'm in Afghanistan. I'm one of the best people you got, and I'm going to come help. And what I found in the public sector is crisis and, and crises that, and giving people a chance to connect to a real moral purpose does, in fact, unlock a different level of passion, a different level of behavior, and a different level of commitment. That can be easier to tap into sometimes during a Haiti crisis or an Ebola crisis. And part of the leadership challenge is figuring out how to unlock that same passion and that same willingness to innovate and that willingness to give, give your all on a longer term journey on something like vaccines or hunger and, and food security or any other issue uh, you might confront in your day to day. But I would say, uh, one thing is definitely tap into people's natural desire to make a difference when it matters and when it has some higher calling than, uh, than just simply uh, serving themselves. Uh, the second thing I'd say is, you know, I, I, really, I really think people have to feel empowered to be their best. And I wrote the book because as we look at these big challenges, I don't want us to feel disempowered. And I do feel like a lot of the messages we get from social media are also negative, that it's easy to be disempowered. But I get to be surrounded by people who are bringing to me like great new solutions for energy, for food security, for fighting hunger, for building housing cheaply and using new technology in the aftermath of massive crises. And that just keeps you very positive. So my other kind of leadership trick is surround yourself by at least a few people who just radiate that positive, optimistic energy uh, because you need some buffer uh, from the outside world and you need to maintain that sense of, of positive optimism around whatever it is you hope to do. Great, so we're back online. So I got a couple questions to wrap up with. Uh, this is a very typically MIT question, which perhaps I slightly <laughs> apologize for in advance, uh, which is, and you did allude to one of these already before, but where are some of the big bets you've taken that have failed? And you know, what lessons did you take away from that? And then also, um, do you recommend backup plans in the context of these big bets? Yeah. So uh, the, the, I wrote a chapter about a failure, and the failure was this effort to build a large uh, hydropower dam to, that I thought could help 
provide power and energy in a low cost, environmentally friendly way. It would have had the impact of taking one third of the US auto fleet off the road. And we had done a lot of very high level negotiation around it because President Obama and President Xi of China had a summit meeting at a place called Sunnylands years ago. And coming out of that, they had an aspiration to show the world that as two, that two powers could collaborate for good in some notable manner. And so I sort of ended up uh, leveraging the politics of that to really mobilize billions of dollars and lots of head of state commitment from a lot of partners and a lot of corporate commitments to, to get this project off the ground. And, and then it, it was basically killed uh, quite publicly uh, by the United States Senate that passed a, a law that was probably the most specifically written law that we've had in a while that basically said, Raj can't do this uh, <laughs> and, uh, and shouldn't try. And, and, then, uh, and then in an interaction with the then president of the DRC, a few weeks later, it became clear that we'd never be able to abide by the transparency we needed to do this effectively. Uh, all of which I had been warned about earlier but I ignored the warnings because I was just charging ahead. And so the lesson I draw for myself was know who you're betting on, that, that big bets require really knowing people and knowing people personally, like what are their passions, what are their red lines, what are they willing to do, what are they not gonna be willing to do? And going through that exercise of thinking about who are your partners gonna be, what do they really care about? Not what they say, not what their teams say, not what their press releases might say, but what do they actually care about and why? Um, and that's, that's a lesson I've learned. Uh, in terms of backup plans, yeah, you should absolutely have backup plans. There's no question. But I would say even more than backup plans, I, and this is an MIT concept too, it's just like learning how to be rapid in learning and adapting to things is pretty critical. Like I go back to that Ebola example, the big problem on the early part of the response of Ebola was there was no real data. It took a week to validate a positive case. And in a week, you just get a ton of spread. And so, uh, so we deployed young people on motorbikes into villages to make visual judgments about is someone likely positive or not. Uh, we asked a famous epidemiologist from Sweden who's since passed Hans Rosling to go and sit in Liberia and run a data operation. And I literally asked him to send me a spreadsheet every day. And I didn't even care if the data was that accurate because I wasn't worried about uh, too many cases that were thought to be positive with, but ultimately would not have been validated as positive. Instead, I just wanted to know where are all the likely positives and can we get resources out to keep them from spreading quickly as the data is getting validated. And ultimately, that data architecture allowed us to learn what of our ideas worked and what of our ideas didn't work. Uh, and we had plenty in both camps. So I don't know if you'd call that having a backup plan. The burial teams would have been a backup plan if you were writing it historically, but in practice, it was the first version of the burial teams was sending families a bucket with a sponge, soap, and protective equipment so they could treat the bodies, wash the bodies of the deceased in a respectful way, but stay safe while doing it. That turned out to be a very, very bad idea. Uh, and, and so we quickly pivoted off of that to these burial teams. So you could call it a backup plan, but often even using that phrase sometimes makes you think you can plan everything out and often that's hard to do. And so I, I'm a bigger fan of just build data systems that let you know what's working, what isn't working very, very quickly and be willing to pivot and adapt. Great, so I think we have time for one more question and I'm gonna take one from the poll everywhere and I think this is a great place to finish. I imagine your life can be a little bit exhausting. Um, you know, lots of high stress activity, you know, lots of travel. Um, Kind of how do you organize that? What are the support systems you have to stay healthy and motivated and you know, able to sort of bring your full self to work each day? Gosh, you guys ask uh, real <laughs> questions. I mean, that's, that's tough stuff. I have, uh, you know, I, I don't know that I have a great set of answers to that. I, uh, when I was younger, I just charged ahead and did things. And when I was in the Obama administration, I was fairly young for the roles by traditional standards, and so I just worked all the time and traveled all the time. Um, but I have three three young kids, 
And I did realize, and I left ultimately my role that I loved running USAID because I realized I just was never present or around and that was just not sustainable for our family. Um, one, one way of making up for that that I don't think really makes up for it but at least made me feel good was I convinced myself that it'd be okay since I was away so much, but I would make sure each kid got a chance to sort of see the work and be part of the work. And so before I left USAID, I took my son, who was probably then eight or nine, to Haiti, and a friend who has since passed, who many of you probably know because you're in Boston, but um, Paul Farmer, who had built this beautiful hospital uh, in Port-au-Prince, uh, took him on a tour of the NICU, the neonatal infant care unit that he was so proud of. And so, you know, you try to integrate your work with your family when you're working that um, intensively. Uh, but ultimately, I had to leave government because I just couldn't sustain it. And uh, I think now it's a little bit better balanced. This book tour is not, maybe not. <laughs> but uh, other than that, it's been a little bit better. But I don't have real answers. I mean, it's probably the toughest real thing you have to deal with is, is getting uh, getting the chance to be intense and focused in the work you do while also protecting your time for your own health and wellness and for your family and for your kids, for those of you that have kids. And, you know, I, I think as a society, I hope we're getting a little better uh, than we were uh, all the time. At Rockefeller, we're like three days a week now to give our teams a little more flexibility uh, in terms of presence versus getting to work from home and be present. Uh, and I guess my best answer is, or a word of advice might be, just choose something you do with your career that you want to talk about at home and you know, uh, that's not so disconnected from your values and who you are that you get to uh, let your families be a little bit of, more a part of it than otherwise. And if you have that opportunity, it can be very, very rewarding. So. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, let me just remind you all, Roger's gonna stay with us for a few minutes. We have books and uh, opportunities for you to sign a few of them. This has been fabulous. I know you're a busy guy. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Thank you very much for this. Thank you, thank you. Thanks so much.